How many different kinds of derivatives are there? There's futures, forwards, swaps, options, and of course there are many variations of each type. So in a sense there may be hundreds, indeed thousands, of different variations. But thinking of them as futures, forwards, and options is not maybe the most insightful or, or informative way to think about them. Hi, I'm Doug Carroll for InsidersGuideToFinance.com, here with some hopefully helpful ways of thinking about different types of derivatives in a much more informative and insightful fashion. Boil down to their very bare essentials, all derivatives can be fit into one of two categories forward commitment contracts or contingent claims. Now, this is way more than a simple academic way of classifying different types of derivatives. Having some sense of the familial characteristics that distinguish between the two types of derivatives establishes a very good base for understanding the type of exposures created and the pricing and valuation of each. Now, let's identify the more traditional names of different derivative contracts with the two categories. So for forward commitment contracts, all forward and futures contracts fit under that heading, as well as all of the forward commitment swaps, interest rate, currency, commodity, and equity. Contingent claims, well, two broad categories, options, and that includes all types of options from the simplest, most straightforward, plain vanilla put or call, as well as the more complex exotic options, as well as credit default swaps. So even though CDS have a word in common with the forward commitment swaps, CDS, credit default swaps, are much more analogous to option contracts. Now, what are the key characteristics that distinguish the two categories from one another. Well, let's start with the forward commitment contracts. The key word there is commitment. In all forward commitment contracts, both counterparties to the trade are incurring legal obligations, financial commitments to live up to uh, under the terms of the contract. Now, to, to illustrate that, to not leave it at such a completely abstract level, a couple of examples. For instance, with a futures or forward contract that has a delivery feature. And of course, not all do. Some are cash settled. And even many futures contracts that do have a delivery feature will be closed out for cash. But let's start with the real basics. So for a forward or futures contract that has a delivery feature, what are the counterparties to the trade committing to? What, what legal obligations are they exchanging? Well, the seller or short is incurring the obligation to make delivery. The buyer or long is incurring the obligation to take delivery. So that's the legal obligations, the contractual commitments the parties are making to one another, the obligations to make and take delivery respectively. Or to expand things just a little bit, what about say one of the swaps, maybe a plain vanilla fixed for floating interest rate swap would be the best vehicle for illustrating the concept. What are the counterparties to a plain vanilla interest rate swap exchanging? Well, one party is committing to pay a fixed rate of interest, the other party is committing to pay a floating rate of interest. Now, those are just a couple of illustrations, but the point is that all forward commitment contracts result in the counterparties exchanging legal obligations. What are some of the implications of that? Well, let's start with a pricing illustration. In the vast majority of forward commitment contracts, the parties are exchanging these equal but opposite obligations at fair value. What's sometimes referred to as an at-market swap, or in the parlance of the current uh, interest rate swaps market, a par swap. What are the implications of counterparties exchanging equal but opposite obligations? Well. Under those circumstances, which counterparty has an advantage? Well, of course, if counterparties are exchanging equal but opposite financial obligations, contractual commitments with one another, neither party has an advantage versus the counterparty. Implication, the initial value is zero. Now, some might think of that as something of a sort of an academic or theoretical curiosity, but so what? 
Well, think of the capital efficiency of being able to establish a position at literally no cost. Because for a par swap or futures contracts are always entered into at fair value, neither counterparty owes any money to the other. Implications of that? Well, think about the potential capital efficiency in terms of creating market exposures. Now understand what I mean by the word exposure. In a financial market sense, when, when one has exposure, that means you have a position in the market. And if the market moves in a way that benefits your position, you generate a gain on capital. On the other hand, if the market moves in some fashion that disadvantages you, you suffer a loss on capital. Now, of course, one can create exposure in any financial market, but the amount of capital necessary to create the exposure will differ dramatically between securities and derivatives. What does it cost to create $10 million worth of exposure in, say, the U.S. Treasury market? Well, of course, it's going to cost you $10 million, which means you either had to have accumulated $10 million on your own or have convinced someone to lend or deposit with you that $10 million. How about in, say, Treasury futures? Well, in the futures market, one would have to meet a margin requirement, but a margin is not a payment to someone else. It's a deposit that amounts to a good faith deposit or a performance bond. So one could meet their margin on Treasury bond futures by putting up interest-bearing assets, investment-grade corporate bonds or Treasury bills or something like that. And the account holder is still collecting the interest on those securities, which means effectively they can acquire the position at no cost. Now, a, a, a typical margin requirement on treasury bond or note futures might mean cash or securities with collateral value of say 2% of the notional value of the derivatives. So for instance, I might be able to create $10 million worth of exposure in treasury futures with maybe as little as $200,000 of cash or marginable securities. Now, that's the capital efficiency I was referring to, but note <laughs> that's not an unmitigated good because capital efficiency is another way of saying leverage. So if I can establish a position with capital or securities with collateral value equal to say 2% of the market exposure created, well, that means a move in my favor of 2% has doubled my money, but a movement of 2% against me has wiped me out. So I'm not saying capital efficiency is an unmitigated good. It is a characteristic of forward commitment derivatives that's a potential advantage. What about contingent claims? Well, the contingency is a bit complicated with credit fault swaps, so I'll not try to get into credit events and triggers and things of that sort. This is too brief of a video to discuss CDS in detail. But I suspect many viewers have at least a basic familiarity with plain vanilla puts and calls. So using them to illustrate, what are the contractual circumstances of the buyer and seller of a put or call? Well, naturally, the buyer acquires the right to do something. The seller incurs an obligation to do something. Let's be a little bit more specific and talk about a call option. The owner of the call has the right to buy the related asset or security. The writer or seller of the call has the obligation to sell or deliver the related security or commodity at the exercise or strike price. Well, to, to weed away some of the detail there, the buyer of the option acquires the right. The writer or seller of the option incurs an obligation. Clearly, that's an inherently unequal contractual situation between the two counterparties, one with a right, the other the obligation. That means that normally options should always entail some cost to the buyer. And that would even be true for an option with a very little time left to its expiration, the expiration of the contract, and even one that is way out of the money. That is where the price of the related asset would cause one not to currently want to exercise the option. For instance, using a rather extreme illustration of Google back in the spring of 2016, there was a series of 660 calls, that is the price at which the owner of the call had the right to buy Google, and Google was currently trading at only $630 a share, and the options were going to expire in two or three days. Now for options on a typical stock, the options would have been trading at one to two cents a share, <laughs> that is one or two dollars a contract. 
the Google options were actually trading at about 25 cents a share. That's $25 a contract. And that's because occasionally Google makes rather extravagant moves, especially on the release of market moving information like an earnings beat or miss. And it turns out for that particular quarter, uh, Google announced a slight beat, but the market was very much enamored of Google's performance, and the stock traded from 630 at the close to about 675 in the after hours trading for that session. Within minutes, Google had moved by $45 or more a share. All of a sudden, those options that had been worth 25 cents a share, or uh, $25 a contract, were now worth $1,500 a contract, $15 a share. That's an illustration of why the buyer of an option should always have to pay something. Well, that again goes back to that unequal contractual relationship, the buyer having the right, the seller incurring an obligation. That's why normal options should always have a cost to them, because that's what's going to make it a fair deal. Given the unequal contractual relationship between the right on one side and the obligation on the other, the buyer of the option has to pay the seller the premium of the option, to compensate for the risk the option writer is incurring as a result of entering into the contract and granting the buyer the right to do something. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can go to our YouTube channel or Facebook page to see other videos on a range of investment related topics. Or you can go to the website, insidersguidetofinance.com. At our website, in addition to the free video shorts, there are a series of modestly priced in-depth training videos with running times of approximately one hour each that go into a number of subjects in greater detail. The website and Facebook page also contain information about open enrollment programs I will be presenting over the next few months and my recently released book, The Insider's Guide to Fixed Income Securities and Markets.